Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future in Review podcast, where we talk with leaders in tech, science, and business about the future of technology and the global economy. I'm your host, Barrett Anderson, the COO of Future in Review, which The Economist has called the best technology conference in the world. And I'm here today with Jonathan Hurst, who is the chief robot officer at Agility Robotics. Um, just a few weeks ago, Agility announced that it will be opening RoboFab, which is the first robot manufacturing facility, I think, in the world um, in Salem, Oregon this year with capability to produce more than 10,000 robots per year. So big. It's an exciting time to talk with you, Jonathan. Welcome to the podcast. We're so excited to have you here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. This is fun. And we're, the other reason that we're talking now is because Jonathan is joining us at Future in Review as a speaker this year, which will take place November 6th through 9th in L.A. at the Terranea Resort. So, Jonathan, to start off and just to give people a sense of what kinds of things you're interested in, how you think about the world, this is a podcast that highlights people who are building the future of technology. Can you describe your the future that you, Jonathan, are interested in building? And I'm asking you as a human now, not as a robot. Absolutely. I, I'll give a, a two-part answer to it, okay? So first off, where I'm going is robots that coexist with people mm -hmm. and are there as a tool and a partner to us. And I really view it as robots being like, almost like a service animal in that there's something that you do interact with, that you do respect and care about. They're there in service and doing really useful things for us. Um, and because of the utility and because of the cost that they're going to be, which is very low, they're going to be ubiquitous. Having robots like Digit in the world, in human spaces, in our environments, it's going to be as common as cell phones, as common as cars. And so that's what I'm about here. It's what I'm excited about. It's why I'm so excited to be in the field of robotics and be at the forefront of this human-centric robot, call it a revolution. It's a real inflection point in history where 10 years ago, 20 years ago, of course, robots were always in places where you design the environment for the machines. And just starting now, it's feasible for robots to be going where people go and starting to do some basic human right. workflows and do useful things. That's never going to go away in yeah, 10 what, years, in 20 years. So one of the, just, not to interrupt you, but just for people yeah. who are not familiar with kind of some of the challenges of robotics and industrial man robotics, especially. Sure. The, Human safety is one of the biggest challenges, right? Because... Well, there's a lot of things. Robots are so different. They look... Building a machine that looks like a person is easy, relatively, mm -hmm. right? But building a machine that actually moves like a person and can interact with the physical environment the way that an animal or person does is new and continuing to develop. So robots to date, when you think of manufacturing machines, are all these fairly rigid position control devices that if they do come in contact with something that they didn't expect, tends to break things uh, or cause injury. Right. A person gets right. in the way. And that's very different for how humans pick things up and how humans make contact with the world. But there's a reason why humans are so much better at mobility and manipulation, the combination of mobile manipulation. And that's why it's much more about the forces and compliant interaction with the world and so on. And so how have you all built that into your to digit? So that's the second part, like you asked about my personal interest of where mm -hmm. these robots are going, right? So this all started with much more of a scientific curiosity and a specific interest in how do animals work and how can we then implement that on machines? How can we make machines that reproduce the dynamics and the physics of how animals move? So that was the technical puzzle that I'm very passionate about understanding. And then the implication of that is once you solve that, and now you can have robots go where people go and coexist in human spaces so that you don't have to modify the environment for the robot. Mm -hmm. The robot is really designed to interact in the same environments that people are. That opens up huge markets and huge capabilities and, and just such a difference for how things can help us. Think, think of it like how much a cell phone has helped us with information at our fingertips and how much easier it's getting when you can talk to your phone. Mm -hmm. And then think of that for the physical world and having right. robots that can physically interact and not just be informational. That's what so, this is going to be. I'm, like. I'm super curious about this because Isaac Asimov classically has the laws of robotics. Is there an underlying set of laws for how humans and animals interact with the world that you've based this technology on? 
honestly, it's much more the way we've thought about this. I'll answer two different questions. You're asking two questions. The first one is just the physics of it. And when we think about you're going to make contact with the thing you're going to pick up or you're jumping off a table and you're landing on the ground or something like that. If you have a machine that's just very rigid and has a lot of inertia and things like that, it doesn't matter what software you write. That impact is going to be such a collision. It's going to dent the floor and break the gearbox. And it's not physically possible for that piece of hardware to really be compliant and soft in its environment and, and pick things up the way people do. So the very first things we were doing, we're trying to understand that ground principles, those passive dynamics of the physical hardware and the low level controls right. so that it's even possible to walk and run outdoors and grasp things and so on. Then once we understand that foundation, you can start to build on all of the path planning and the perception and the decision making and so on. So that's one part of it. Then you're asking about like the rules, like the Asimov rules, right? right? That to me is much more corporate governance. Like how are we going to be responsible as a business for how we deploy the tools that we're creating and how we use them? And do you have a set of guidelines for that? Or how are Absolutely. You can you talk about that? No, we've, sure. We are about doing useful things for humanity, right? And doing, having a really positive impact on the world. And so we want to make the best choices we can about how we deploy these things that's going to maximize that. And so one of the things, as an example, we've joined up with Boston Dynamics and a number of other companies to sign this open letter about absolutely no weapons or weaponization of our robots enforced through software licenses, through contracts, through everything else. When we sell our cost robots, when we develop our robots, when we deploy them with customers, that's like the hard line that we've chosen. Just to be clear, absolutely no weapons. Can you say that one part one more time? No offensive weapons okay. or our robots used or connected to an offensive weapon of any sort. So that is a, po a policy that you've said internally, you will not That's sell right. robots for that purpose. And we've signed an open letter with a number of other robotics companies in our field that have signed the same letter and can use that kind of as a foundation of creating laws about mm -hmm. it as well to enforce that kind of agreement with others. If one of our robots were ever to injure a person, that's terrible for the industry. That's terrible for the impression of the people who are trying to actually do good things with it. So really it's that when we go into the workplace now with our robots, we are under OSHA rules. We are under all of the same safety guidelines, regulatory and compliance guidelines as any other kind of new piece of machinery that's going into these, any of the logistics or warehouse operations that are our beachhead markets, our first markets for our business. So that has a lot of data and statistics and functional safety analyses and things to go through to ensure that these machines, these robots that we are deploying are factually and safe. So there's a lot of, even when I talk to people in my day-to-day -day life and I, I've brought up, I was talking to you and we've got this, you've got this new robot factory. A lot of times the response and the reaction that I get from folks who are maybe not in the tech industry or not in robotics is, oh no, that sounds terrible. Can you, I think there's a lot of fear around robots and especially robots that interact with humans. And I think, and there's also fear around losing jobs, job loss. Can you speak to some of those concerns that people have? How do you think about those things? Sure. First, I would say that a lot of the concern that people have is simply because of movies and media. And I actually think that's very important because it allows us to explore all of the worst case scenarios, all of the possible mistakes that can be made right. and think about it ahead of time and envision it and then make sure that's not what we do make sure that we really do stay on the uh, benefiting humanity side of the equation. And then when it comes to jobs and careers, honestly, truthfully, think about this as a tool just like any other. And we're entering markets where maybe four or five years ago, there were 600,000 unfilled roles and they couldn't hire people for a bunch of these roles. Mm -hmm. And since then, those past four or five years, there have been hundreds of thousands of robots deployed. And today, there are over a million unfilled roles. Increasing the automation, the size of the market, the capability of businesses to be able to provide these services to customers, that's the thing that expands. People are ambitious. We want to do more. We don't want to be just satisfied with only what we're doing right now and then be more efficient and, and do with less people. We want to always do more. And so that's what these tools are going to allow us to do, just like throughout all of history thinking about how many people are farmers now versus in 1800, and right. then how many other careers exist throughout the country and throughout the world as a result of people being freed up from some of those kinds of things. One of the 
it seems to me that one of the kind of key applications of digit in particular is like heavy lifting, moving. Mm-hmm. Is that accurate? Are there other, what, are, what do you see? Yeah, it's the, it's the kind of process automated tasks mm-hmm. that right now is treating the people who do it. Um, maybe, let me say it this way. The vision of our company is to enable humans to be more human. And human beings prefer decision-making and variety and creativity. And typically when your task is for eight hours a day to Box. pick up a specific thing that the robot has told you to pick up mm-hmm. and put it on the conveyor belt behind you, it's a job, but it is not a, I, it's hard to fill those jobs, to right. stick to facts, right? And avoid any sort of judgments on that very hard to fill those sorts of jobs that are very repetitive. And so those are the perfect jobs for a robot to go into, the things that are process automated. Already it's designed so that there is no decision-making, so that there is no creativity, and so that there is no variety. It's the classic three Ds of robotics, the dull, dirty, dangerous. Also these kinds of jobs or tasks, I would say, that have the significant repetitiveness in them are the ones that tend to have the repetitive stress injuries. Right. So the way to look at it is, I changed my verbiage a little bit there to call them tasks because that's what they are. A job has variety and creativity in it and people being able to do a number of different things and have some decision making. A task is like, well, you're going to use this tool in order to do this thing. And that's where the robots come in. So I'm curious at Agility, you recently, earlier this year, you were previously the CTO and then Melanie Wise joined your team. She's now the CTO. You're the chief robot officer, which is very cool. I feel like that's the kind of mm-hmm. title that like every ch- every little boy dreams of or a little girl dreams of. It's like someday I'm going to grow up and be. Can you tell me more about what is the break? What is the current breakdown between those sure. two roles and how do you all work together? Sure. So Melody comes in with such a, a vast wealth of experience after um, founding Fetch Robotics, being the CEO of Fetch Robotics and building that up through through an acquisition and a sale. And so she knows the market inside and out. She knows the logistics customers. She knows how to deploy thousands of robots and build out a whole system of robots and a fleet management system, uh, a full product, the service for the customer kind of thing. And my background, I really come from an academic background. As I mentioned earlier, I'm coming from the, I want to understand the technical puzzle. I want to demonstrate and show the robots having the physical capability to do the things. And so it's a great partnership where she's very focused on right now, How are we going to design the technology around our machines in order to deploy these in the immediate future? Mm -hmm. And I'm much more focused on, okay, but looking two, three, four years down the road, what are the blockers that we're going to run up against? What are the pain points that we're feeling right now? And how can I then go down and unblock those? And I innovate and create some ideas that then once we de-risk those ideas through some of the innovation group, they're ready like a gift rack package for the engineering group to then pull those into the product at the appropriate time. I'm also a lot more involved in who is Digit? Like, how do you perceive the robot? It's closely related to the kind of the brand, the personality of the company. We want these machines to be completely friendly and totally non-threatening and something Mm -hmm. that people feel very comfortable around. So that's my area. And you you can see how that partnership works. That's awesome. I like that breakdown. It's a good kind of like systems and future and how do they, the two converge. So tell me a little bit more about a day in the life of a chief robot officer. What does your t- typical day consist? <laughs> it's an awful lot of meetings. Yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, it's meetings on various different aspects of the company and, and choices about which direction we want to go. We're, we're looking at how do we want to manage our investment and our, our planning moving forward. Um, thinking through with the, the commercial team, what's the right match of customer applications for the capabilities that the robot's going to have. I think of myself in this company as protecting the future. I have at least a guess that I always want to check hypothesis driven. Am I wrong? And could I be wrong here? And could I be wrong there? But then picking up with the team, where is this going to look, go in three years and five years? And then let's make sure that everything we're building and designing right now is on the path. We're not going to achieve the robot that's five years in the future or 10 years in the future today. There is a long road to get there. Right. But we don't want to take a 90 degree angle and do a bunch of engineering that's uh, going to be a dead end. Right. We want to make sure that we the work choose that the path that's going to. We'll, yeah. Yeah. We'll set you up for the we'll, future. We'll both serve the customers today in the near term future and set us up on the path to keep this flywheel going 
so that we're going to be able to get to the future. Because of course, we have to be serving our customers as the number one priority of a business in order to be successful. The second priority is to get to this really exciting future piece. And if we can be successful in first, we can achieve the second. So what is the really exciting future piece? Can you talk, can you tell me more about that? Yeah, look, I think of this in technology eras mm -hmm. and I've broken it down into five of them where the first era of technology is, let's just show one robot doing one useful thing. Right. And to my knowledge, Agility the Robotics MVP, is the- The MVP, if you will. The MVP, just yeah. the single piece demonstrator. And to my knowledge, Agility is the first company that's done that. We've shown this human-centric, multi-purpose robot. It looks a little humanoid, picking up these totes, doing a customer use case. And we've demonstrated that. We demonstrated at ProMab six months ago, just in front of tens of thousands of people, the robot doing that task. And we're starting to deploy then with, with our customers right now. So that's the first thing. Arrow one is do one thing well. And error number two is scale it. Just have a whole bunch of robots deployed doing that one thing really well. Mm -hmm. And then era three is you start doing the adjacent use cases with right. the same robot so that now you have two, three, four things that you're doing well with a scaling fleet of robots. So the first thing might be just pick up a toad off of a, a shelf and put it on a conveyor belt. And then the next use case is going to be different workflows. Different companies are going to have different size cases, different positioning types of shelves, and then stacking totes and then nesting totes and then pushing a cart around and then gradually then expanding out to boxes, starting to do depalletizing, starting to mm -hmm. think about trailer load and unload, and then gradually moving our way out. And so then as we're doing that, there's this kind of, think of it as the basic capabilities and skill set of the robots for what they can perceive and what they can pick up and how they can make decisions. And then above that, there's the specific use case that it's doing. And think of this as like the application layer, the API layer, right? So we have a product digit. Our applications engineers come into a customer site, learn their use case through and through, and then figure out how to deploy the robot and then scale it with their use case. Eventually, that API is going to get so good, tools like the large language models and decision-making that the robots can make is start to get better and better. And now it starts to be something where commercial entities can just buy pallets of robots and then basically train the robots on site to do their workflow. And it really doesn't require our engineers to sit down and program it. And you keep going down that thread. Now you get to the point of being able to just talk to the robot and ask it to do things. And that's when it becomes a commercial product. And there's a bunch of technology threads that I would say that are needed to learn that. Like safety is one of them. Right now, this robot really needs to be protected. And if a person walks into the area, the robot sits down. And that's to make sure with the abundance of caution, we're meeting all of the regulatory compliance, data-driven proof that what we are doing is actually safe. Over time, we're going to be able to collect the data and show that the robot is safe in physical contact with people and working next to people in a consumer product kind of, of way. And then at that point, we have robots that are like a telepresence machine. You log into this thing and then think of a supercharged horse and rider where the robot is largely autonomous in a lot of ways, but you can be in your VR goggles and telling it where to go, what to do, and hanging out with family remotely. Same thing in the medical situations. And when the robots autonomously can be doing things like retail and so many different markets, it starts to grow when it's got that kind of decision-making and that kind of autonomy. Is there, when we talked about movies earlier, where, mm -hmm. and I think that does form a lot of the basis of the average person's understanding of robotics. Is there, when you think about robot movies, is there one that you think is most close to the future robot robot that you want to build? Actually, I would say it's the first half of iRobot with Bill. Okay. It's right before like all their lights turn red. Yeah. And then there's the magic central brain that controls them all. That's not real. Um, yeah. So just stop the movie before the, and, and by the way, we've been really careful to make sure that Digit's eyes can never turn red. So it can never be evil. So <laughs> funny, that is the universal sign of an evil <laughs> robot, right? Like I know. Before it gets to that point though, they show the use case of these robots as couriers carrying things all around. They show right. the use case of the robot like elder care. Someone's living alone and really aging in place and a robot is there to help them. Someone what can is, easily remove. You probably know, what's the movie with the, ro the robot that helps the elderly grandfather and they, you know, turn into like best friends? Oh, is it? Start getting yeah, in trouble, Frank. Yeah, Frank. Uh, Frank and Me or something yes, like that. Yeah, Frank and great, Robot. Frank and Robot. Like that's a really great film about robots because it's, I you agree. know, it's yeah. really a helpful. It makes him happy. It's got a yeah. companion. I really enjoyed that movie too. And I thought that was also a very thoughtful exploration into what robots can be in the future. 
and also a really great exploration of exploring the ethics of how these machines are going to be used and finding the gray area and exploring that. We're going to have that, have that stuff ironed out before we really deploy these things in, in real life. Definitely. Yeah, the okay. other thing, by the way, that from iRobot that I thought was interesting is it's the first time I've ever seen in a movie, they're depicting real compliant interaction. They have what looks like these McKibben actuators, the muscles, right? Now that specific thing probably... What is, what is a McKibben actuator? Oh, for, for years and... Let's see. Google it. It's been out there for years and years. I don't actually think that it's a viable, like specific technology, but... The important piece is that it is a compliant thing, not like a hydraulic piston. Okay. And like all the previous robots were really copied after like industrial robots and hydraulic mm -hmm. pistons and so on. In an iRobot, they show a actuation technology that's so much more human in order to be able to create that compliant interaction with the world. So first time I've ever seen a sort of a popular movie depiction of that recognition of the difference between how robots move in, in industry and how they're going to need to move when they're in human spaces. So there's a lot about that I really appreciated. Okay. So one last question for you before we wrap up, which is as someone who is building this incredible, incredibly innovative product, I know that there's a lot of trial and error that goes into that in general, not just in robotics, in any field. And I'm curious if you can tell me about one mistake that you've made that really taught you something. All right. I can think of a bunch. I'll think of one like way back, okay? Okay. When we were first even just trying to understand how uh, to make a machine that can walk and run like an animal, our first robot, this is before Agility Robotics, is, is Atreus, um, which was just built to model a bath model of animals. So we built this thing. It was very successful. It's the first machine to reproduce human walking gait dynamics. It cracked that nut of the mm -hmm. science core. But one motor was always acting like a brake, doing negative work on the other motor. There was this work loop just internal in the mechanism. And boy, we didn't see that coming. That led to configuration changes in the leg, which led to what we see on Cassie robot, which has lived through then to digit. I don't know if I would call that a mistake because you can't know what you don't know until you start trying things. But I, th I think that's the point of the question, right? I think that, you know, there, anyone who's building new things is constantly making mistakes on purpose. Mm -hmm. And so there's this opportunity to flip that narrative on its head and say, okay, cool. Mistakes are awesome. What do we, what can yeah. we learn from them and how do we move forward and how do we take those in a positive direction? Yeah. I think the challenge for us is we are making hundreds of mistakes, of course, because we're doing something that really hasn't been done before. And we're deploying these robots in, in with customer use cases and it's, it's a little painful. And yeah. I think it's going to continue to be very painful over the next year and more because it's going to be a lot of work for us to support this and to ensure their success. Because we're going to be running into all the things that we didn't know before. Right, that you didn't them. anticipate. But it's the only path. It's the fastest path to get to machines that are actually going to be useful in the world. Uh, so that's why we're doing it. Jonathan, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a fascinating conversation. I look forward to continuing it in person in November. And I wish you all the best of luck in continuing to build out the future of robotics. Excellent. Thank you very much. This is great.